Okay. So many people. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, that trick is basically literally what it sounds like. Uh, I made it twice. Good effort, right? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be back. I spoke like uh, three years ago here, exact same spot. So that's really cool. Um, so yeah, welcome to my talk, how to make browsers compatible with web. My name is Ola. Uh, I'm actually a, f a Firefox engineer, but I'd rather say I'm a senior front-end engineer. I work on web compatibility and also on perf HTML. And I'm normally a total dork on stage, so you're allowed to laugh. That's totally OK. <laughs> uh, I also organize conferences. Uh, I speak at conferences, um, Open Tech School, something I do too. I get bored, so I do things. Cool, so <laughs> let's start. So what is this about, this web compatibility thing? It took me like a month to actually pronounce that word. So if you can't, it's OK, right? So did you ever experience like a website that was broken in like one browser but not the others? Yeah, cool. <laughs> so web compat box is something that actually, something works in all browsers except with one, no, sometimes maybe two. So tell me, because why not? By raising your hand, three questions. Who of you ever experienced such a bug? Please raise your hand. Right. <laughs> OK, uh, next question. Who of you reported that bug? Catch. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Good job. So if you get them, if you miss that, you have to name it, though. There are more. Gifts, friends. I don't have friends, so I give you gifts. The very last one is, and that's the most important question, who of you ever wrote like a really dirty hack for that bug? Raise your hand. Take a look around, right? So please don't do that. Report those bugs so we can fix them, because we can. But if it makes you feel better, you saw that, right? You're not alone. So I ran this totally representative poll on Twitter with like 400 votes. And surprise, close to 80% of the people do not report bugs. So why is that? A lot of people actually think it's too much hassle or have no idea how and where to report them. Finding bug trackers can be like really hard. I get that. I didn't do that either before I started actually at this project. So let's change that. So the Web Compatibility Project is um, an open source project. So we take care that specs get implemented in the same way in all browsers, right? Not just Firefox. So report a broken website, like a reoccurring uh, issue on this side, so we can help and fix those issues. And it literally takes two minutes. This is the form you have to fill out, and some stuff is already like pre-filled, so it's not that bad. So. If you don't want to report this bug with your GitHub account, which is legit, you can report it anonymously. Like a lot of people hassle a little bit. They're like, oh, probably this bug is already known. I don't want to think that people, uh, I don't want people to think that I'm like not the smartest person on earth. You are. And it's okay, we'd rather close this bug as a duplicate than do not know about it. And the second thing is, you might browse, let's say, interesting sites you don't want people to know about. <laughs> FYI, those sites are the first one that get fixed. Just a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> so the other issue is that people think that no one cares. We actually do. And we have this massive uh, network of vendors, browser vendors, and sites that we annoy, like pretty much all the time be like, fix this, fix this, fix this. So you don't have to do it. You just have to let us know, right? So that works. So I'm a quite curious person. So I ran a second poll. I wanted to know, how well do you know uh, the specs of your preferred language? And this also includes stuff like HTML, right? How well do you know the specs? And people seem quite confident. And that's cool, right? Are you confident with your preferred language? Just move your head. You know what? Let's test it. Let's pick something that's really simple, because everyone knows how easy and simple a piece of cake CSS is, right? <sighs> so let's try it. OK, please tell me in a moment by raising your hand, which of the four 
options, I will show you in a moment, work in Firefox, in Edge, and in Chrome, they obviously, you will realize in a moment why, work in Safari. Don't mind the syntax. It's just about the last piece of it. So we have a WebKit transform, right, CSS, with a capital W. This is the second one. The third one is prefix, and the last one is transform. That's quite obvious. So please raise your hand. Who thinks that the first one works in all four? Uh-huh. Who thinks that the second one works in all four? One, two, three, four? Oh, plus Safari. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Who thinks that the fourth works, the prefixed one, in all four? Last one? Raise your hand. It's OK. It's safe. <laughs> <laughs> so, surprise, they all work. <laughs> Sorry if I made you feel a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> Browsers are weird. So of course, it's Twitter poll, my bubble. It's nothing representative, right? I totally get that. So from our experience, those results that people are confident look more like that. <laughs> I mean, people know frameworks by heart, and it's totally OK, right? Um, don't build a town when you just need a house. Don't rent if, reinvent the wheel like over and over again. And when an issue was solved like a million times, you don't have to solve it again. It's, it doesn't make sense. But you should be aware of actually how things work, and not how, but just like why, like just, just the concepts of it, right? And that's how you get it. With like all the frameworks coming out, like new one every day, <laughs> um, you can't keep up. It's impossible. And we just have basically 24 hours and seven days a week. I had this conversation even this morning. Like some people of us, surprise, even have a life. So, right, you maybe, when you're lucky, you have like eight to nine hours a day, like within like five days, if you're lucky. So we can't learn all this stuff. And there are moments I really miss those times, like way back then, where you don't need like all those things, like Grant and APM and Webpack and Travis and post CSS, and you have to be aware of those things and know those things, right, to work with it. And a four-hour setup basically just to fix a typo. That's so hard. Or, tw or wait like 20 minutes on your package install because pip is a pain in the ass. <sighs> a long time ago, we didn't have that hassle, right? We just opened an editor and a browser, and things worked. We pushed stuff on the server, and it worked, right? And that, that, that was nice. <laughs> that was so, so easy and simple and lovely. But we had actually different battles to fight. And if you're as old as I am, and I'm way older than you think, trust me, uh, I get that a lot. Some of you might remember the browser wars. <laughs> Good times. So a browser war defines as competition for dominance in the usage, usage share of like a web browser, right? So let's have a very short look back at the history of like the browser wars. So it all began with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, cool dude, really nice human being. And he invented in the late 1980s uh, this thing we called the web. Not the internet, just FYI. Um, he also invented this very first browser. This was called World Wide Web. It was renamed to Nexus at some point because reasons. By the end of 1992, other browsers appeared, like Lima Browser and Urwise and Samba for Mac. Anyone use that? Shit, I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Even though like these browsers tended to be like really simple HTML viewers, and they needed like an external application for, for example, um, to view multimedia content like an image, right? They provided a choice, and that was cool. So that was the time where like the pre-war started. Mosaic was the web browser that actually led to the internet boom of the 1990s, and that was really cool. In 1993. Uh, it made the, relevant act uh, the web actually relevant, and it touched off like a whole revolution. It was amazing. More browsers appeared, like Cello, Linux, but nothing was there like Mosaic. In 1994, Mosaic was, and I can quote that, well known uh, on its way to become the world standard interface. And that was set by Gary Wolf in 94 from Wired, and he definitely knows. So. 
Mosaic was the very first true multi-platform browser, and that was a huge thing back then, right? And it's kind of hard to believe these days. Like, wait, multi-platform? We have that today, so. Several companies licensed Mosaic and created, because they wanted to create like commercial browsers, like Spy, Mosaic, Spyglass Mosaic, or Air um, Mosaic. But uh, one of the developers uh, from Mosaic, Mark Anderson, um, he really loves open source, so he was like, Nah, I don't think so. So he released this browser, uh, which was called Mosaic Netscape. They have to rename it to Netscape Navigator. And by the beginning of 1995, so a year later, uh, the Navigator, that was the dominant browser, right? So everything changed. And um, that was because of two reasons. First, it improved basically the usability and reliability of the browser. And wait for it, it displayed pages as they loaded. So you saw this, like, it built up. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and it was free for non-commercial use. And you'd be like, how can a browser not be free? Wait, whoa. <laughs> but it was. Netscape faced new competition. Also, IE1 was released back then, but yeah, there was nothing like, um, like Mosaic. Uh, like that escape. So there was basically the moment the first, very first browser war began. Users had suddenly a choice between like two usable multi-platform browsers that were cool and free. And the war began. The battle uh, for market share was really rough, and browser vendors added features like on the fly. It was like that. Um, and also the specs, which got really interesting at some point. IE2 was released shortly, and it was also free for commercial use. That was already a changer, like a game changer. So other browsers followed and made the software completely for free. That was really cool. New versions, versions were released rapidly. Browsers were like document viewers, right? So they could just interpret HTML. So Netscape released JavaScript support. That was so cool. And Microsoft thought, that's cool. Let's do it too and call it just JScript. They also both released like more proprietary HTML tags, which I adore still until today. Very important ones like Blink <laughs> or Marque. <laughs> we still use this, right? In 1996, A3 and Netscape both added CSS support. And that was so cool, right? And they reached feature parity within one year. Uh, side note, Opera came out at the same time. and just note many people noticed because they didn't have those features, right? So that was a little bit sad. But then, in October 1997, the IE4 was released and distributed with Windows 95. So we know everyone is lazy. They don't want to install things. And it was there, so people just used it. And well, that was a game changer, and things got a little bit personal. So IE4, they had this release party in San Francisco. And they had this massive e-letter, 10 foot tall. So they were like, let's put this on the front line of Netscape. <laughs> and attach a sign <laughs> from the IE team, we love you. They kind of didn't like it. <laughs> so Netscape employees just kicked it over and put their old, like, this is the old Mozilla mascot, and just top of it and slapped the sign on it, which said, Netscape 72 and Microsoft 18, and that was the market distribution back then. So, <laughs> personal. Um, the AE started with a market share of 18%, right? But it became the new dominant browser by 2002 with 96%. Can you imagine that? Pretty much everyone used that browser. So the first browser war was actually decided, and IE was left with no remaining competition. Uh, of the market share, right? So the second browser war started because new browsers came out and IE competition again. So next round. Second browser war was continued with the decline of IE's market share in 2003 and increasing popularity of browsers including like Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, right? So Opera released in 2000, cool. IE6 released in 2001, gave it the boost to climb actually to this massive market share in 2002. Safari released in 2003. They were smart. They actually coupled, coupled that with uh, Mac OS Expander. That was smart. They learned. They also released a mobile version in 2007 with uh, the iPhone. Um, Mozilla Firefox was released in 2004. 
Google Chrome released a browser in 2008, like the first version of it. So the very first browser war was a lot about usability, multi-platform usage, and being free for everyone. The second browser war was decided through the focus on engineers. It was all about like performance, browser engines, usability for developers. And don't get me wrong, Firebug was amazing. That was a massive thing back then, right? But it got unusable at some point. Chrome DevTools made like a massive impact on the community and the market share. Also beginning by like 2012, uh, Google launched a uh, Chrome beta for Android 4. So where you can see like the line, this is basically where everything changed. Again, pairing a browser with a system, smart cookies, decided the war. One thing we've learned during the browser wars was it didn't make things better. It actually made things so much worse. <laughs> and I know that marketing loves to be like, we're all battling in the mud for market share, but we're actually like inside, we're not. We're all working together to make the browsers actually compatible and the work. So you, you have actually a choice because of the features of the browsers and not because the browser is just your only option and your data gets like swallowed. So, okay, that was your history lesson. So as browsers started to use the same browser engines, right? Things got a little bit better, but the APIs were still like a pain in the ass. So why was that? Let me tell you a secret. Do you know what the real true force is of a browser? The specs. They're your friend. So specifications and specs in short are like a defined standard, right? For what, what to implement in the browser. But who creates the specs? Who's the creator of the force? So this cool dude, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, you remember that? He founded the World Wide Web Consortium in, two, uh, no, in 1994, uh, short W3C. This organization wants to like, foster compatibility and tries to like, release um, standard set of standards and principles and um, components which are chosen like by the consortium so you can implement that. So in short, they decide on specs. There were issues. The W3C was kind of slow in developing standards because developing standards is hard. Trust me, I had a discussion yesterday about a specific ECMAScript API for like two hours if we should which, which, which like, character we should put in there, and discussion is actually going on for a year now. So that's fun. Um, and browser vendors wanted to release like, the features really quickly, right? So, well, they often didn't have specs or half-baked ones or not even really finished ones, and that basically caused this incompatibility all across the browsers. Also, the W3C decision to abandon HTML in favor for XML technologies didn't seem like something that people really wanted. So that was a little bit tricky. So that was the point where, and I have to read this because I can't remember that, the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. You all remember that now? <laughs> so it's what's WG or how we say in West Germany, what? Like WG? That was formed in like June 2004 by individuals from Apple, from Oprah, and Mozilla. They worked basically on like drafts of specs, right? And then they suggested to the W3C, and it's like normally they get accepted. And what the what their difference there is that the editor of the spec actually has like still this massive amount of responsibility and they're responsible for everything, right? But the community has a massive influence because they ask the community about what they think. And besides this big advantage of having like very direct feedback from engineers um, and users, this working group solved another really important issue. So the W3C tells you in the specs what to implement, but not how. Anyone of you remembers the story of IndexedDB? If not, look it up. It's, 
<laughs> it was implemented and in different ways. And it was like, oh my God, <laughs> please decide on one thing. And it's there and it's cool, but they actually can now agree on how to decide, like implement those things. And it makes sense like because it's in the specs. So wait, does this mean you, all of you, can be a part of this process? You can create the specs? Yeah, you can. So you can either become a member of the W3C, which is a little bit tricky, so you can apply, become a member when you're lucky, pay a small fee depending on your country you live in and your job and other things. Or you can join the mailing list of what WG because we all love mailing lists, right? <laughs> or <laughs> you can contribute on GitHub. It's actually that simple, right? So every specification has like a repository and you can discuss in the issues and give your direct feedback and they actually listen. So it's really nice to check it out. Also the uh, TC39 is something that takes care of SPACs and if you have questions about that, just let me know. <coughs> so you might be still like, why should I care? Why? I just want to build my apps in the world to leave me alone. Well, remember that one? The question that made you like feel really uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> okay, browsers are weird. I totally get that, right? Browsers, browsers. Pff, even Tobias in the workshop yesterday was like, but specs. <laughs> specs are solid, right? Okay, I mean, take a look at that. Um, this one is like from the, W3C CSS object uh, model draft, like the specs. Which was is correct? I mean, obviously, number four is correct. Does any one of you think one, two, three was actually in the specs? Please raise your hand if you think that. He was right. That was actually in the specs. So every browser had to implement that and would struggle with this until uh, since then. It's still in the browsers. So why did this happen? So this happened because Apple really wanted to have this feature. So they wrote the specs. And for them, it totally made sense to put this in. They just didn't think about that specs have to implement it like one to one into every browser. So, and this is why it's actually important that not just one company or like a small group somewhere hidden in the basement decides on a spec. The community, all of you, you're important. Your voice actually matters, right? So you should participate. And now you know how. <laughs> and this maybe wouldn't have happened if someone would be like, uh, duh, by the way. Mm. So you can actually help and fix things. So what are specs? What is this even? You can think about specifications like a set of rules, right? It's actually nothing else. Um, it's a set of rules um, everyone agrees on to make your lives easier. Like those guys, are, hi. Makes your life easier. So programming is a really hard profession already, right? It is. When everyone you know follows the specs, it makes their lives easier. You will be able to understand code from others, save time, save your, keep your frustration level low, save money. And that's cool. It's well, it's a little bit like those set of rules, the specs, a little bit like our code of conduct for code, right? So how can you produce clean code? Let's check that out. Um, except of help to form the specs. What can you use? So first, being aware of the specs is nice. It's not the worst thing to know. You don't need to be, be aware of pretty much everything, but sometimes just a peek is cool. So where to find specs? W3C side. You can find all the specs there. It's got way better to read. When I started to read this, it looked way different and, and weird, I know. Uh, so MDN has also like pretty good pre chewed content. MDN is now like a combination of different browser vendors who contribute content and it's really cool. You can fi find like pre chewed content. You can find code examples, uh, code pens you can play around with and also like the links to the specs and the compat tables for how I like to call it, not like web compat bugs, but surprising features. So, okay, you're aware of the specs, right? But not sure about compatibility because no one remembers that. Go to canius.com. 
you want to use something specific, you know which browsers your, your uh, users actually use, check it out. Just take a look, you know that you can use it or not. Uh, there's even this fun CLI tool you can use uh, that gets the information in an automated way. So you can write like a decent scrapper with curl and do a lot of fun stuff with it. Just imagine all the possibilities. It's really cool. And you can also just have a linter. There is this linter that's called uh, ESCompat plugin. It's open source, works in pretty much every editor, and it's really neat. Just warns you and be like, you're fucking up right now. Stop. <laughs> so, okay. Fun question from before. Not third quiz time. Like, sorry about it. But this is something that makes something very important stand out. So, prefix seemed like a really good idea back then to have specific features, but surprise, that was never meant for production. And no one knows that. <laughs> But everyone uses it, right? So the vendors got like the message and decided just to move away from that and go towards like flags. So you have in your config, you have flags so you can enable specific features, test them out. And the cool thing is you don't have to change your code later on. And that's really neat, right? You don't have to have like post CSS processor and all those things. So yeah, uh, this is my most favorite topic, PWAs. Um, and I know when you see it, you're like, Compatibility, of course. <laughs> so I'm totally tired of talking about PWAs because I think I know by now like 18 different definitions of what a PWA is. They founded like a working group in November, I think. <laughs> Finally, I hope they will come up with a solution soon. But um, just filling something. Um, but the only thing you need to know is please make sure to be backwards compatible, right? Which means your specs are stable. If they're not stable and experimental, just use uh, polyfills or polyfills. Please make others aware of drop deprecated browsers. They vendors let them die actually for a reason, so that's good. Write tests and test your sites. That's super important. Browser stack as well as source steps are a great way to go to automatic your whole testing uh, on various browsers and operating systems, right? And write tests for your APIs, please, so you know actually when something breaks. You can also run your tests locally when you install Selenium. And everyone who, who, who worked with Selenium before? Who loves it? <laughs> you get a fox when you come downstairs after the talk. <laughs> yeah, it's so much fun, right? But you can also just use WebDriver.io. This was my lifesaver a few years back. It's an open source testing utility for Node.js. Takes away a lot of pain, for example, sandbox evil and stuff like that, which is cool. Plus, it also lets you test, uh, run, uh, lets you run visual regression testing, uh, which is basically, it takes screenshots uh, for every defined operation system and browser and either saves them in a folder so you can go through. If you don't want to do that manually, you can automate that and just like make a diff. So you know it differs more than 3% because pixel perfect isn't something to strive for. Uh, it differs like 3%, so let me know. Otherwise, it's okay. I'm cool with that. So you know the tools. Cool. Clean code, biggest step of saving uh, the web. If you feel like this is still something that it's like not enough, you can do more. You, all of you, can become a vompad. <laughs> I'm a vompad. So there are so many of us out there fighting fight, fixing the web, but what do Wompets do? <laughs> like, how can you become a Wompet? Okay, so focus for a very last time. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So listen to this little deep voice inside of you, right? Listen to the force and think about what you like to contribute. What's your power? What's your superpower? Because all of you have one. And then just open a browser of your choice and go to webcompo.com. So you're already helping a lot with reporting bugs. But also, if you have like some spare time, you can triage bugs. So basically, just check if you can reproduce, and then they move to the next step. Uh, this is something you can do within five minutes. If you have like 10 minutes somewhere, just do it. If you have like two hours, awesome, just do it. Go for it. Um, yeah, uh, you can also like, um, that's the next step, diagnose bugs and see, like, I d I've never learned anywhere else that much at, like, diagnosing bugs because you have to, like, dive deep a little bit and it's really cool. You might also lose faith in humanity, but... 
well, yeah. You can also like reach out to sites and suggest fixes if you know people, or you can work on specs, which is really cool. Uh, you can help and build uh, tools. Uh, just help us. We have like uh, on GitHub a few repositories. Right now we're working on a machine learning AI that checks those bugs automatically. It's really cool. So feel free to help out. And if you have an idea, let us know. So the Web Compact community is actually very kindly hearted. It's lovely, and it's always very helpful. And this is why I'm actually there. I've been in a lot of communities, most were shit, but even Philly is there. So join us in RC, mailing list, spread the word, talk to your friends about compatibility, like, please. And let's fix the word together, uh, the web together. So, okay, time's up. Totally have done that. I'm sorry. My daughter made me to do this. Um, <laughs> If you have questions, I'm around, or ping me on Twitter. The handles are somewhere there. Uh, find me somewhere. And yeah, together uh, we can fix the world a wide web and destroy the Death Star. Thank you so much.